So, my name is uh, Jim Wilson. I'm currently a uh, senior manager of the Gate Analytics of Canada Airlines. Uh, the title of this talk is Pub Sub at Canada Airlines, but we're going to talk a little bit about the airline and talk a little bit about uh, Apache Pulsar. So, the agenda. Uh, Made in Chicago, United is headquartered in Chicago, so that's why I'm here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about United, the airline industry, how the publish subscribe compute model uh, presents opportunity for an airline. We'll talk a little bit about Apache Pulsar and Apache Bookkeeper, and then we'll throw in the use case that uh, any airline we have, not just United Airlines. So, just a quick uh, word about United since it's a Chicago company. Uh, United currently has uh, over 1,300 aircraft uh, split between uh, mainline, which are the ones that fly the longer routes, and regional, which are the little planes that you jump from like here up to Wisconsin on. Uh, they've got 250 planes on order. So right there, the data problem, one of the first data problems any airline has is any kind of supply chain problem. You've got a fleet of 1,300 aircraft. You've got to do all the uh, maintenance on them. You've got to do all the ordering on them. Any maintenance large fleet type operation, uh, any data problems related to that, analytics problems related to that, and airlines going to have. United moved 158 million passengers in 2018, that was last year. Uh, in order to do that, you have to have a public facing website, you sell inventory to the public. Uh, that inventory obviously seats, ancillary sales, things like that. The biggest uh, part of the sales is obviously a seat. That is a unique, kind of a unique sale because that's got a time component to it and it's a uh, sense of supply and demand. So it's not something that has a fixed price, it's something that price varies uh, based on demand. And it also has a geospatial component to it. So I'll see, I'll see, you know, a window seat might be worth more than a middle seat. So the sales, the simple sales that uh, an airline has are actually quite complex. United also has a mobile app, so you have all the problems, all the data problems that come along with having a mobile app and having people check in uh, from around the world uh, at any time of day. Uh, loyal, loyalty program. So when you've got 150 uh, million passengers, a lot of those are part of the uh, loyalty program. So you have all the problems you have maintaining a customer base, all the surveys, all the uh, loyalty uh, campaigns, anything you do to retain your customers. An airline has that problem too. There's 4,900 daily departures, so that's uh, all the scheduling, all the operations, all the weather, all the route planning, all those data problems that come with managing a network. Uh, and really also has. 35 or 355 airports in 48 countries, all the baggage claim, all the check-ins, all the things you do at an airport to get through uh, off the street on board the plane. And they've got 88,000 employees worldwide, so they all need to be scheduled to aircraft on routes and they all have to get paid. So for an airline, everything is constantly in motion. Uh, a lot of the analytics we do is not only rear past looking, it's also forward looking. So with all these problems and the fact that the future is constantly in flux changing, everyone's booking planes and booking seats and changing seats and uh, buying Wi-Fi and adding on stuff to their, their trip, the place, an airline is really a data scientist dream, data engineer, data scientist dream. They've got every problem there is, and it's a very complex problem. You can spend a career working at any one of them. So at an airline, the business goals for any analytics team is uh, one fall, falls into one, one of four buckets. Uh, obviously, improve the customer experience. That's number one. You want to reduce friction, booking reservation, getting through an airport. You want to make the customer experience better so that they'll actually enjoy them. Uh, how do you deliver a consistent message across all the channels you uh, you work with? So on mobile, on the united.com, uh, with travel agencies, how do you keep a consistent message across all those complex channels that you've followed over the years? The second thing is uh, improve employee experience. So like we said, we had 88,000 88, employees, they're out, out on the front line, how can you make their jobs easier? That's the second, big goal that any analytics uh, group at an airline has is the employees are the people on the front lines making the decisions. How can you use technology to support them better? Uh, what are you learning from the surveys and how are you using that to, to make the airline better? 
And then the third is obviously revenue generation. You're trying to uh, maximize revenue. And then fourth is uh, improve operational reliability. So that is uh, when a bad weather hits, a maintenance situation comes down, how do you react to that efficiently and put the uh, customers under the least amount of stress? So all of these are compute problems we deal with day to day. And then there's just some industry ideas I've seen uh, float past, and these are different airlines and different ways to improve uh, customer experience. Uh, all airlines have some kind of data analytics uh, group that's trying to use emerging technology to uh, solve the, these, air, these problems these airlines have. Okay, so now we'll talk about uh, PubSell. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk was pretty much I didn't know anything about Apache Pulsar until a few weeks ago. Uh, I learned very quickly at Flint Forward in San Francisco all about it, and it got on my radar very quickly, and well, I'm here to make sure it's on everyone else's radar because I think this is a very interesting compute model, and I think it's going to get bigger as time goes on. I think they solve a lot of, a lot of problems uh, correctly. And I want to just make sure that everyone who comes to this understands what this, this framework does and how it differs from some of the other existing frameworks that are out there. Okay, so what is Apache Pulsar? Uh, and I, I ripped most of this stuff right off the website or from other presentations I've seen. So um, I try to keep the points high level, uh, not get too deep down into the weeds. So we'll just go through what this platform does and, and, and how it does it. And if, obviously, if you want to learn more, uh, the website, the mailing list, the, uh, the framework is all out there. You can you can uh, tinker with it, see see what you can get into. Do. So Apache Pulsar is an open source distributed uh, pub sub messaging system originally created at Yahoo and not part of the Apache Software Foundation. So the goals that they tried to meet with this framework is uh, it's designed for low publish latency. So uh, obviously any messaging system out there has to be somewhat uh, low latency in order to get messages from point A to point B in a reasonable amount of time. The trade-off on that is you also want to maintain strong durability. Obviously, if you uh, have all the time in the world get a message there, you can make sure it gets there. But the trade-off there is how do you do both? How do you uh, uh, get a low latency and strong durability? And you'll see uh, on future slides here how they actually uh, accomplish that. They also provide persistent message storage. So this is one of the uh, other little key points of this, this framework is storage in this framework is not designed to be transient. It's designed to be permanent. So if you add data to this platform, they give you several options to actually persist the data permanently in this platform. And one of the ways they do that is by setting up tiered storage. So the tiered storage allows you to rapidly respond to uh, message traffic and also store it for the long term. And it's a matter of how far up the tiers you go or how far down the tiers you go, the trade-off between uh, latency and cost. It was built from the ground up as a multi-tenant system. So uh, unlike some of the other pub sub systems out there, it was designed as a multi-tenant system out of the box. So as an enterprise, we've got a lot of tenants. Uh, We've got all sorts of different businesses, all sorts of different business cases. Uh, it's nice to be able to take those and isolate them and partition them into uh, parts of the cluster, parts of the, uh, of the infrastructure that's assigned solely to them rather than mixing and matching across uh, a rather open uh, framework. Uh, Geo-replication, this is another important thing, the ability to replicate data out of one area into another. This was designed in from the ground up as well as part of the framework. Uh, obviously, adds to durability and resiliency. Pulsar is running at, in production at Yahoo. It's been running there for three years. They were the ones that came up with it. Uh, they've got millions of messages per second flowing through this thing. Uh, they have millions of topics. Uh, it's it's got to scale up to hundreds of nodes. So the difference here is the millions of topics. The, this framework allows you to have uh, a whole lot of topics rather than, and it, performance doesn't degrade with the more topics you add to the, uh, to the implementation. You can easily de 
deploy lightweight compute logic on top of it. So instead of going to a secondary framework to do uh, processing, you can they give you a lightweight framework you can use. It's native to the framework that you can use to solve uh, lightweight to medium weight transformation problems. And then finally, the out of the box deploys on Kubernetes. And if you go to the website and you read the deployment production for, uh, deployment notes, they'll give you several uh, OpenShift, uh, the Google Kubernetes, AWS Kubernetes. They'll give you instructions how to deploy this production quality, so it's high availability, fault tolerant, and all. So this was this uh, multi tenancy diagram they had on the website. It's for a given cluster, you can split it up into multi-tenants. And so in the example, in this case, they've got three tenants. Each tenant underneath them uh, can have a namespace below it. So it allows you to plan and capacity plan for different use cases at an enterprise a little more tightly than you would with uh, a framework where you won't, won't be able to do any of this. The capacity in this case is assigned to a tenant. And the namespace is the administrative units uh, for your tenant. So this gives you a nice hierarchy so you can start plotting out uh, how you're going to design your cluster and how you're going to expand how you're going to expand it as it either rises. There's three different subscription models for the pub sub. Uh, these are an annotated here. The first is uh, exclusive. So I've got a uh, pub sub where I've got an exclusive. Uh, subscriber, uh, that's probably the most common. All the guarantees in the, in the framework are guaranteed in this model. The second one is, is shared. So you can have multiple pub, pub or single publisher, multiple subscriber, that's very common in, in the compute model. Uh, right now in the framework, if you're in a shared mode, uh, ordering is not guaranteed. That's They're working on that problem right now. If you go to the Jira and see, they're, they're putting the, the uh, uh, infrastructure together to uh, make that more isolated and durable. So that will be going forward. That will be one of the uh, uh, in, a, in the future release that problem will be solved. Uh, and then the final subscription model is failover. So that's you have uh, someone subscribing and they fail, and it's taken over by someone that's uh, going to take over from the subscriber that failed. So that's very simple. Those are the three. Uh, subscription models that they talk about on their on their website. The reference architecture, the core elements of Apache Pulsar is a broker. So a broker does a couple things. It sits between the publishers and the subscribers and the storage chair. So in this case, uh, the broker, if you look at it, it, it consists of a pretty much a dispatcher and a managed ledger that resides in RAM. So this is one of the ways they can get a uh, low latency on reads. It's part of the uh, message flow. is stored in the broker, cache and broker in this ledger. And as we'll see in the, the future slides, the whole tiered storage is going to be a matter of getting stuff out of the broker, out of random broker, onto disk where it's, where it's persistent. The other components here are the uh, Bookie, which we'll talk about, that is the storage component. Uh, that's part of the uh, Apache Bookkeeper framework, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the uh, omnipresent Zookeeper, which is always used for uh, the metadata for any kind of uh, cluster operation. So in this case, there's two types of Zookeepers. One's for a local cluster, and then one for the global install if you're using you know, Algeria or application. So this is the building blocks which they're going to build the framework on. So one of the key points on uh, in, in the terminology, uh, it's scalable fault tolerance, low latency block storage service, delivery durability, consistency guarantees that can provide access to both historic and real-time data. So right there, what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring storage as part of the framework. So uh, I know Kafka does that, they're, they're moving in that direction, they're trying to do that. This was designed as a ground up to be uh, permanent storage as part of the framework. So the atomic unit of this framework is an entry. So if you take a bunch of entries and you put them together, that becomes a ledger. 
the uh, a stream is an unbounded flow of ledger. So you've got there's two concepts in this, in this framework. One is uh, a bound ledger, and the other is an unbounded stream. And an unbounded stream is just ledgers that never end. The individual servers storing ledgers are called bookies, and that's part of the uh, Apache Bookkeeper uh, infrastructure, which serves as the back end for Pulsar. Entries are written to the ledger sequentially and at most once. So it's uh, basically a pen only, put the new ones on the end. Uh, once a ledger is closed, it can't be opened again, it's immutable. So we'll get to that advantage you get uh, by having these ledger segments. We'll get to that in a few more slides. But each bookie will handle a segment of ledgers as part of uh, a stream. So if the stream is broken up into uh, discrete components, each bookie will manage a different part of that stream. And that will help with the uh, resiliency and the uh, scalability. So there are another uh, for the bookkeeper reference architecture, uh, there's basically two APIs for bookkeeper that Pulsar leverages. One is a lower level uh, ledger-based API it allows you to actually manipulate the ledgers on the ledger level. And then there's a higher level, which is the uh, log stream API, which you can use if uh, you don't need to manipulate uh, the ledgers specifically. So again, this is how the storage backend on Pulsar works. The uh, Zookeeper cluster is also used to manage the uh, uh, the metadata for the, the bookkeeper cluster as well. So the storage requirements that, that this bookkeeper framework is trying to solve. Okay, so clients should be able to write and read streams of entries with very low latency. So that's under five milliseconds. That's the published uh, latency that they have. Even when providing strong durability. So Pulsar is actually, their, their ability requirements are actually uh, met by bookkeeper. Data storage should be durable, consistent, fault tolerant. Uh, the system should be able to enable clients to stream or tail ledgers or propagate, propagate data as they're written. So any kind of pub sub model where you're going to publish and someone's going to subscribe to it, uh, you should be able to tail entries as they're written. And the system should be able to store and provide access to both the store and real time data. Again, that's the storage is part of the framework. So you should be able to leverage uh, historic data that's been stored. So how does it do the how does it meet the durability requirements? So basically it works on, on a column type basis where uh, when I do a write, I'm going to specify what the replication factor is, and that's going to re uh, represent how many different storage uh, nodes that it's going to get into, how many bookies it's going to get written to. And then as part of that, I know I have to wait for an acknowledgement back uh, for a quorum that is also configurable how many are going to respond to that right. So in this example, uh, I think the, let's see, the right form in this case is three. So all our trees are written to three, three bookies, three storage nodes. And the act is uh, two in this case. So we'll, as soon as two of them act, the transaction is considered complete and it is passed up to the uh, calling la la layer that the uh, storage was successful. So you can see from this model, how this would scale out. It's just a matter of adding storage nodes and uh, optimizing the write form and, and optimizing the, uh, the act form. And you can see right there how you can get durability, you can trade off durability and latency. And then consistency and availability. Uh, consistency for log reads. An entry is successfully written if it's immediately readable. So that's that's the goal you want. As soon as you want to write something, you want to be able to read it. Uh, an entry that's read once is always readable. That's the second part of the consistency guarantee on the framework. It's once it's uh, once it's read, it's it's not going away. It's immutable. All entries that have been previously, extension to that is all entries that have been previously been uh, written are always readable. And then the consistency guarantee is accomplished via a last add confirmed uh, algorithm, which is several pages of documentation on their website, how they go through that. And it's 
uh, an optimized version of earlier of the two-phase command. So it's very in-depth how they document how they do this and how it does give you the guarantee of uh, consistency. It's on there and it's, it's pretty detailed. Uh, availability. Well, from this you can see that obviously if you've got storage nodes, you get rookies that are available to respond, you will have availability. So availability, guaranteed availability is just a matter of adding more bookies, more storage nodes to the to the cluster. And that can be done scale horizontally, horizontally. Any the other thing that to note here is any bookie can read the data. So it's not just a matter of going to a leader or uh, a designated uh, read node. Any bookie in the cluster can, can service a read. Okay, IO isolation. So this was an important topic. They, there's really three ways to access uh, a stream. Obviously, the first one is write. And when you write, you always write to the end of, of the stream. Uh, that's immutable, so that is the, the main write operation. The tailing read is when you read off the back end of the, uh, the queue. And as we saw in the reference architecture, if you're reading off the back end of the, the screen, uh, you're going to be most likely hitting the cache itself, RAM, not hitting uh, what's on disk, or one of the lower levels of storage here. The final I.O. operation is a catch-up read. So that is where you're reading somewhere other than the tail of the, of the screen. You're going back and you're reading uh, data out of one of the other segments. And that's uh, one of the other APIs that give you to go back in the screen and read data that has been written previously, historic data that's been written. And that, I think that differentiates this from a bunch of the other uh, frameworks out there that you can go back and, and get data out of a uh, historical pool that may be stored on the lower tier and not impinge the read-write capability. So the data distribution, uh, this explains how a segmented stream is split across the cluster. So each one of these storage nodes uh, is in charge of different segments of the, of the stream. And the storage capacity for a single log stream is constrained really by the capacity of the cluster, never a single uh, single number. There's no stream rebalancing required when capacity needs to be added. You can add another bookie to this and it will be advertised itself as open for business and then it will start accepting rights uh, for segments. So there's no rebalancing that's going on between uh, different members of the cluster. Replica repair, well, that will obviously require traffic between the cluster. If uh, a node goes down and it gets replaced, uh, it will have to know which segments to load and where to get them from. If, if one of the if booking number three goes down, it will have to get the, the green, the blue, and the red uh, segments from somebody. So that's the only time that these guys are going to be uh, shuffling data back and forth is in the event of uh, uh, a failure, not in the event of adding capacity. And this is all possible because of the screen being segmented. Okay, so bring back to uh, Pulsar now. Uh, the infinite stream can be seen as a bunch of discrete segments of stream. And the different operations that we talked about on there, the write, the tail, the read, and the catch up read, that is uh, the main building block of Pulsar because that's how uh, streams are implemented in Bookkeeper. In book so the tiered storage, that allows the ability to take segments and offload them from the uh, cluster store onto uh, commodity storage. So if you've got an infinite stream that's broken up into discrete pod parts, you can uh, use an offloader to take segments out of the cluster and put them onto S3, put them onto Hadoop, put them somewhere lower value on the cluster. If you know you're not going to access them uh, or need, look, need latency, low latency to, uh, to access them. They give you the ability to uh, an API to actually access segments, and you don't have to do that necessarily through the broker. You can go right at the segments themselves. Again, making the catch-up read not affecting the I/O of the uh, tail read in the, in the right. 
So bringing it all together, this is uh, in effect how uh, Apache Pulse are, what it's bringing to the table. The segmented stream, the ability to tier the storage and not let the slower tiers affect the, uh, the low latency tiers. Uh, the fact you can scale out with the uh, producers and the consumers, and you can manage this in an unbounded stream that never ends by managing uh, the storage levels, is really what, what this framework does, and how it improves on the existing frameworks. So, what this really allows is a dual framework that allows batch processing and stream processing simultaneously. Uh, which I think is, is rather unique because you can use the stream processing API and also stream processing API to do the, the pub sub part of the problem, solve your pub sub part of the problem, and then your analytics part of your problem uh, can be solved using batch processing. That would allow both analytics and real time cases to potentially store uh, solved in the same, the same framework in the same place. So for an airline, this is important because we've got a lot of uh, streaming use cases, and what I'll talk about here is a pub sub use case that's uh, used to improve operational reliability. So we talked earlier about an airline having to uh, understand what the environment's like in order to schedule aircraft, in order to react to weather, in order to react to maintenance problems, uh, problems at airports, things like that. The FAA has put out a real-time message feed called SWIM. Uh, System-wide information management. This is their future way the FAA is going to communicate the state of the airspace, communicate the state of airports uh, to consumers. So the, the thinking here is all the airlines submit all their information they have via stream to the FAA. The FAA aggregates it and then distributes it to all the other airline subscribers. So this is a very progressive uh, framework that the FAA is proposing, and it's actually operating right now. Uh, in this case, the airlines are going to need to do uh, two things. They're going to actually need to be able to submit their data as it's happening and be able to consume what the other airlines are doing if they're going to leverage the full uh, capacity of this, uh, of this offering. So not only the real-time operational stuff uh, are impacted on this, but analytics as well. If you've got... Uh, all the message traffic, all, all the airspace is being uh, operated on, all the airports are reacting to uh, changes in the airspace. You can do some pretty powerful analytics, uh, especially predictive analytics on that. So this is the overview of the swim feed. Uh, basically, this big feed is chopped up into a bunch of different components. Each component represents a different phase of a, of a flight. So there's uh, messages that uh, occur on the ground, right when the plane pulls back, ground traffic, uh, when a plane is cleared to take off, when a plane is climbing to its cruising altitude as it's going through the transition airspace, uh, when it gets up to the cruising altitude and then when it comes back down and lands back at the, at the target field. Uh, all of those parts of the flight phase are part of the, uh, the feed that the FAA is giving out, so every part is equally important. So I have a sample message up there, it's probably hard to read, but I just ripped off one of the messages to kind of, so you kind of get an idea of what information that FAA is actually uh, publishing. So this was a flight from Newark to Los Angeles uh, I took a couple weeks ago. And you can see some of the uh, information that's conveyed, conveyed in the speed. So estimated time of arrivals, uh, estimated schedules, uh, when it's passing fixes, when it's... Um, uh, the flight plan, when things are changing, all of these are extremely important information to an airline. If I publish a flight plan in the FAA that makes me do something different, the airline needs to know about that. The faster they can react to that, the more uh, efficiently they can operate the aircraft or operate the airline. So right now, the current implementation, uh, before the swim thing came along, before the standard uh, message system came along from the FAA, this is basically what things look like. We had a bunch of FAA systems talking to a bunch of different airline systems. So I just put some of the major ones that we work, uh, we work on. Uh, scheduling, flight planning, uh, airport operations, airspace operations, weather. These are all things that FAA will 
publishing information to the airlines point to point or expecting the airline to send them information on uh, point to point. So obviously this can all be cleaned up with a modern framework, a pub sub type framework, uh, cleaned up really nicely where everyone publishes their information and everyone subscribes to it very cleanly. Uh, the question is scalability in this case. Uh, obviously with all these different components of this feed, uh, the number of topics is probably gonna be high. That's how you, how you wanna manage this. But the source systems and the target systems all will benefit from going to a model similar to this. The problem on the airline side, that's the side where I'm dealing with, is a lot of these operational systems that do these things aren't pub sub ready. They're not, I mean, these are old systems that are around a long time. Uh, they may have very poor interfaces, if any. So, the three interfaces we deal with most with these systems are in red. So, most of them are file based. So, the way you get information on or off these systems is through files. Um, another way, higher level way is JDBC. These are uh, built around relational databases and they allow uh, connectivity on the database level. A lot of times we'll move data in and out of these systems using uh, JDBC. And then finally, some of the more recent ones will have APIs. You can connect the, uh, the system via an API, but that's by far the exception rather than the rule. So if you're gonna rewrite all this stuff to run off a pub sub type model, you're gonna have to figure out how to sit something between the pub sub and these airline systems until this evolves to the point where the operational systems manufacturers, the software manufacturers, start taking into account this, this speed that the FAA is putting out and start putting in more progressive, progressive interfaces on it. So the pulsar play here, and why this grabbed my attention, is in addition to the, the producer and the um, consumer, APIs, you also have the uh, uh, historical read API. So that, in and of itself, doesn't make sense to necessarily go through a real-time streaming API or just to batch something to a file that you're gonna send to a, another system. The option here would be to take the data coming in as a stream, treat it as batch, to the, bat the systems that only deal with batch interfacing, the file connection with JDBC until they're mature enough to cut over to the uh, streaming interface. So that to me is, is why um, we're looking at Pulsar right now to see if that's a potential solution to this problem, is to see if we can start out using the, the batch interfaces on Pulsar, the historical stuff, to deal with the uh, constraints we have under the operation systems. And then as time goes on, start phasing out the batch and speeding the data into the operational systems in real time as they, as they mature. Okay, and then the two uh, batching frameworks we talked about, Pulsar and Bookkeeper. Uh, got the information on the slide here, all the Twitter, manuals, all that stuff. Uh, the communities are very good at responding to inquiries and, and, and helping you out. So take a look, close look at these projects because I think they're gonna be uh, very important going forward as things scale out and uh, people discover that they need more than what the, the current frameworks are offering. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? So I thought it was pretty interesting the idea that you can use bookkeeper as like a, um, almost the way you use a data link. You have this organized data that's really uh, that can be sense for like how fast it is like Right. The um, we have a benchmark, and that's that's one of the short-term goals. Is, is that actual benchmark is to see if it is a data lake replacement. Uh, right now, we have several data lakes. I think most enterprises have if one, if not more, data lakes. Uh, the question becomes: Is now do you, if something like this is where you can handle streaming and batch in the same framework? and it's a viable store in terms of serving both latency. Does that mean data lakes become more fragmented and people start moving back to the uh, uh, the data mark type view where everyone's got their own data lake and it's a matter of APIs connecting them up? So that's a good question. I think that's gonna, we're gonna have to see how this evolves and 
more people can actually talk about this and get something in production. And I think that's the best way to, to, to answer that question. I have two quick ones. Um, one, the swim data sounds like it's really cool. Is that public for that way? It sounds like it would be funny yeah, they uh, they're working with a service provider to make it publicly okay. available. It's not quite there yet. In fact, I just pinged them this morning to see what the status was, and they never got back to me. So keep an eye on the swim feed because that is a awesome data set. If they do open it to the general public, it's going to be really fun. Oh, to play it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Okay. And then my second question is: It sounds like the FAA is on board with moving all of this like custom model, but United does not just operate in the U.S. Do you see this like movement towards this model with other governments? It's, it's hard to say. You don't know how this is going to evolve. Yeah. Uh, over the past couple of years, they do have uh, several of the message feeds coming out. They're constantly evolving. Yeah. Uh, most of the United's operations are central in the United States. We do sure. have international operations, but most of the network operations are. And that's the thing. If you watch United's website, they offer tours of the network operations center for the last hour. And I strongly recommend going on because it's really cool to see what an airline and operation center looks like. Uh, most of the operations are here, so we'll have to see how it evolves. Um, and we'll see if, if, if the foreign, you know, the foreign equivalents of the FAA see that this is working and, and decide to, to join out the European version of the FAA. Sure. Yeah, as a personal note, I did an internship that had to do with aircraft weather, and we would sit on the conference call where this info was going out. So it's really nice to see years later that it's evolving to something a little more. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so what? That's your question. What they told, what the speaker talked about at the Food Forward Conference in San Francisco was fleet is compute on top of all star storage. That was the model that they're they're proposing. So if you not current future or well, oh, that's that's how they see the two fitting together. So if you look, uh, if you're, so the question is now is for stable streaming, what's the you know, how does this affect the stable streaming model? So Flink's got a pretty solid stable streaming model. Um, if this is used as a storage layer for that, is this in place of Rox TV in terms of storage infrastructure and Flink? I don't know. We'll have to see how it evolves. But it is, they are diverging or converging rather than diverging. The Pusa versus Pusa versus Kafka. So I think the, the big takeaway on this is the IO isolation is probably the biggest. When you read or write in Kafka, you always go to the same place. And that includes the, the higher latency reads. Uh, in this framework, it's split up. The, the lower latency reads go down one I.O. channel, two, two different I.O. channels. And then the, the, the low, higher latency read can go down a third different one. And that can go actually to the bypass, the same uh, infrastructure you're using to do the, the low latency read writes, you know, straight to either the permanent storage or uh, the broker itself. So they, that's probably the biggest difference. The fact that it's, they've got the, the read write models is, is different. Um, the tenancy, multi tenancy is an enterprise that's very important to an enterprise, I think, to be able to assign resources and cluster to certain tenants. Uh, that's the other big one. So I, those two right there should, if you, if you're, if you have problems at scale, you should look at those two things first for another look. Uh, deal with conventional normal in Kafka 
The scenario you just described there will probably require at least a dozen operational systems to act, you know, in, in conjunction with one another in order for that to happen. Uh, if these systems start simplifying the way they communicate back and forth with a scalable message system, that should become more efficient. And especially if the FAA is pushing the airlines in that direction, saying, hey, we're going to give you all information in this format and start updating your systems so you can do that. The internal systems at any airline will start drifting that direction as well. So. You know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but down the road, you can see the the, the, the route that the, the FAA is taking, and you'll see that the airlines will go on. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so the way we've got this laid out is we've got 20 minutes in between talks.